Well, uh, uh, Deacon started it off, us off this evening with uh, the abysmal statistics around the, uh, the real presence, uh, which is why the church has undertaken a Eucharistic renewal initiative. And uh, I thought that would be, make a good subject for a lecturer's reflection and also for uh, our upcoming Night of Night. Um, I, I spent a lot of time on on trying to just distill everything I wanted to say down to 10 minutes and I couldn't do it. So I'm going to just hit kind of three points this evening and then I'm going to, it'll be a two-parter. I'll have to uh, finish this up next time. I want to, uh, uh, because you know this really is, we talk about the Eucharist being the source and summit of our faith and this is really such a critical thing. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, lack of belief is also tied to a lack of catechesis. A lot of people just are not being well educated about uh, exactly what we mean when we talk about the real presence and where those beliefs come from. So you know, I will do my part to try to, to, try to address this. Um, three things I want to hit tonight. I want to talk a little bit about substance. I want to talk about uh, the, the glorified body of, uh, of Christ. And then I want, to, I want to hit a few points from the book of Exodus. Uh, when we talk about uh, scriptural support for the idea of the real presence, of course, we always think of the bread of life discourse. We think of New Testament passages, obviously very important, and I'll talk about those at our next meeting. But well, we really, to understand the real presence, we also have to understand some uh, uh, material that precedes it in the Old Testament. So I, that's what I want to talk about as my part of my conclusion this evening. So uh, substance, what do we mean when we talk about substance? Because when we say that, that Jesus is really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, we mean that the bread and the wine have been changed at the level of substance. So this is how I think about it, uh, and maybe, maybe somebody could pick a, a, a theological issue with this, but it, it helps me to understand it. It's been about 125 years since we've been able to prove that the world is made, or that the, the physical reality is made up of atoms. It's been about 100 years since we've been able to prove that, that, that atoms are made up of smaller uh, uh, particles, uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's been 60 years since we've been able to show that uh, protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. And it's been about 35 years that we've been able to show that there are other subatomic particles not bound up in atoms that are nevertheless necessary for the construction of physical reality. And it's only been since 2011 that we've been able to show the Higgs boson. So I know you all came for a physics lecture. I, I don't want to get off. Now, I do love that stuff, but I don't want to get too far off point. But the, the, the point being that as, as we've got, as our, our scientific understanding has advanced and we've been, we've been able to drill further and further and further down, okay, we, we haven't found the, the, the bottom. The bottom is substance. Substance is that, that level of reality from which everything else grows. It is the, the, the thing that is the most real, the most true, okay? We exist at, at the level of what the church calls accidents. So it's, a, it's old language, don't let the term throw you, but it means a world of appearances. It means the world of things that are built out of all those, out, out of all those lower levels. At the time of conse consecration, transubstantiation replaces the substance of the bread and the wine with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. The substance is where the, the, the transformation takes place. So that's an important point to understand. The glorified body of Christ. So Jesus has been resurrected. He has received a glorified body. Now we don't fully understand the glorified body. It has some connection to the bodies that we have today. I've talked a little bit about this uh, before. But it exists in a, a kind of... Uh, uh, when you mentioned uh, Bishop Barrett. Bishop Barrett always says that the glorified body exists at a higher pitch. It's a body in which the, the flesh and the spirit have been completely united. Okay, when we die, our bodies decay, our souls live on. In the glorified body, it's all one thing. This is important because if Jesus is present uh, in the consecrated host, then he must be wholly present. He's either all there or he's not there. Okay, he can't be just present in some spiritual way, but not with his body and his blood, because because he's not separate things like that anymore. He has received his glorified 
body. It's all integrated, and he has, must therefore be present in his entirety or not present at all. And I, I mention this because one of the things we hear a lot is this, is this kind of half-thought-out idea that, well, I think Jesus is spiritually present. No. That to take that position uh, denies that he has received a glorified body. It undermines the argument of the resurrection. So all this stuff hangs together. So it's important to understand that, that Jesus is present at the level of substance uh, in terms of his body, his blood, his soul, and his divinity. This is not cannibalism. Cannibalism is the eating of a corpse. Jesus is not dead. He's not harmed or diminished. This is how we, uh, how he gives himself to us. This is how we share in, in the sacrifice of the cross. This is, um, which, which brings me to Exodus. So, so we all remember the story of the Exodus. Uh, as the Israelites are, are preparing to flee, uh, Moses uh, receives instruction. The Israelite uh, men each have to, to bring a, a spotless lamb, and there, there are a whole bunch of rules around how they slaughter it. And they have to, to take the blood and smear it on the lintels or the lintel and the doorposts. But they also have to consume it. And this is the thing that everybody kind of skips over. It, uh, it's a, the, 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 the drama of the, of the <coughs> sacrifice of the animal and the smearing of the blood. There are very visual kinds of images that people tend to remember them. But five separate times in the book of Exodus, the Israelites are instructed that they have to consume that, uh, that sacrificed lamb. The, sa the sacrifice isn't complete until you eat it. Why? Well, because the, the, uh, the slaughtering of the animal and the saying of the prayers and the performing of the ritual infuse that animal's flesh with the divine presence. But that doesn't do anything for you, right? You have to consume it in order to, for that divine presence to be therefore inf you know, in infused into your body. That's how you benefit from it. So you have to have the consumption. That, of course, becomes important uh, when, we, when we talk about the, the Jesus being really present, how Jesus replaces the, the, the Paschal Lamb of the Old Testament and how he's really present in, in the Eucharist. Another thing that, that we need to keep in mind or, or, or maybe revisit from the book of Exodus is the idea of the bread of the presence. So Moses goes up on the mountain. He comes down with the Ten Commandments, but he also comes down with instructions to build the ark. Right, the thing everybody was looking for in the first Indiana Jones movie, the uh, the menorah, right, the seven branched candlestick, and the uh, golden table. Everybody forgets about the table, but the table is just as important as the other two. The table is used for the consecration of bread and wine. Uh, the there's a see if I can find the passage. Um, the men of Israel were commanded. To, uh, to gather three times a year. I've got it marked here someplace. The book of Exodus commands that all the Israelite men take part in the three feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Okay, several, um, uh, so, so they, have to, they have to gather, and, and at the, at the, the time that they, they gather for these feasts, the golden table would be brought out of the Holy of Holies, the, and the bread and the wine would be, would be consecrated. Before consecration, the bread could be laid on an ordinary marble table. After consecration, it could only be present on the golden table. The bread of the presence, it's, that's the term that's used in most modern English Bibles. Show bread is the term you see in some older Bibles. But the literal Hebrew description, the literal Hebrew term, is the bread of the face. And it, it, Moses is told, no one may look upon my face and live. Uh, but it also, not that much further along in the book of Exodus, where the men of Israel are, are ordered to gather for the, to celebrate these three feasts, they're told that they have to show themselves to the Lord. That's the usual translation in modern English Bibles. But again, the literal translation of the Hebrew is that they have to look upon the face of the Lord. So how do they do that, right? We don't have, this is one of the, it's a good example of why we need things like sacred tradition, because the Bible just assumes you know that. The answer to that question uh, is found in rabbinical sources that tell us that the way they met this obligation to look upon the face of the Lord was they would gather the, uh, at the temple, the table would be brought out, the prayer of consecration would be said, and the bread would be held up. The bread of the face would be held up, right? So understand that our ideas about the real presence 
the gestures, the prayers. Uh, these are all things that have deep Jewish roots, going all the way back to the book of, the, uh, book of Exodus. They are rooted in the Paschal sacrifice uh, in the book of Exodus. They grow out of that. And um, it's, it, once you understand that the Jews already had a tradition, already had a theological concept of God appearing to them under the auspices of bread and wine, that changes the way or, or affects the way in which we have to read everything in the New Testament. We've got to read it in a way that makes sense of, of what, was, what came before. So that's what I want to leave you with this evening. I'll finish up next week talking about how, how those ideas take us into the New Testament and, uh, and, and how we arrive at our, our final understanding of, of Jesus being really present in the, in the consecrated host and, and the wine. Thank you. Hey Chris, what's the book? Oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a book called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist by a guy, uh, by a guy called uh, Brant Petrie. He spells his name uh, P-I-T-R-E.